just going to give us just a few minutes uh, to just give some more people time to get onto the stream. Althea, I thank you for taking out the time of your schedule to get onto the stream tonight. Hope you had a fantastic day. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. trust that everyone has had a fantastic hump day, you know, if you had to go to work this morning, um, I, try, I hope that you had a great day, in spite of the fact that you had to go to work, and again, I thank you for your time, um, for getting on the stream tonight, we're going to deal with a subject tonight that's, uh, it's pretty important, um, like all streams and every talking point with this platform, um, there's no stream that I do that's not important. All of them are important. Um, many of them piggyback off the next because the problems that we experience in our community are vast, they're large, they're expansive, and they tend to spill over into each other. So uh, the topic we're going to talk about tonight is equally as important as every other platform, every other stream that we've had. Um, on let's talk about it um, so I want you to buckle in but what I want to do tonight is something very special I want to do something different tonight 
not only do I want to uh, speak on the topic that we have as the subject, but I also want to give you ladies an opportunity to chime in on the chat in the chat box to ask your questions. Uh, let me pause this because I have to lay the I have to lay down the the, uh, the ground rules for doing that. Um, I want you to be able to put in the chat box your questions. Just make sure they're genuine. Make sure they're not uh, pejorative. Make sure they're not insulting. Uh, we're not going to get into shame, insult, guilt, and the need to be right. If in fact you hear me say something that you disagree with, that's fine. Um, I. Ex I expect and I accept any disagreements. In fact, I want to hear what you disagree with, but I want you also to be able to stand on the disagreement that you have. It's not enough to just say, you know, I disagree. I don't like the way you said that. Uh, I don't like what you said or who do you think you are? No, see, we're not getting into that. We're not getting into that. Um, insults, <laughs> shaming tactics, all right? Um, if we can't act like adults when it comes to asking the questions, um, that's probably the fastest way to get you blocked. It's also probably the fastest way to get you removed. And uh, so we don't want to do that. We're all adults. Um, we can agree to disagree in some respects. So I think that's I think that's mature. And I think that's uh, room for moving forward. We are having a conversation tonight. What I'm going to say, I don't expect everyone to agree. I never do with any stream. I don't want a um, I don't want an army of sycophants who just simply go along to get along. Absolutely not. That would make the whole conversation point boring, don't you think? <laughs> right? That would make it pretty boring. Uh, I want disagreements but I want you to be mature enough to know that if you disagree that you can stand on the disagreement because everything that I will share with you in every stream will be based on stats data and statistics you will hear very little in any of my streams that come from a personal viewpoint or personal stance as it relates to the talking point. I do my gut-wrenching best to support everything I say with stats, data, and statistics. Not subjective truth, but only objective truth. Not my truth, but objective truth. So with that being said, no profanity, no disrespectful comments towards the host, which would be myself. We're going to have an adult conversation tonight. I'm doing something tonight that I have not done in any stream. And that's where I open up the chat box and allow the participants who are in the chat box to literally ask questions. And I answer you to the best of my ability in real time. So I'm looking forward to this. this to me, I'm excited about it. I hope you are. Uh, get your questions together. I'm going to give you a few minutes to get your questions together that you may have when we get to the point after my monologue. All right? So again, I appreciate all of you that have come into the stream tonight. Shout out to Althea Marshall. Shout out to Gail Chambers. Shout out to uh, Abdul. Let me see. Who else is in here? Uh, oh, man. You know? I almost have a problem seeing everyone who's here. <laughs> Shout out to uh, Khaled. Shout out to you, man. Happy that you got into the into the stream. Um, here's what we want to do. We want to get started right away. So buckle in. I hope you have a pad. Get prepared because we're gonna have some fun tonight. We're gonna. I'm gonna give you the opportunity to ask me questions, uh, disagreements. If you disagree with something you heard me say, I want you to tell me where you believe I got it wrong. That's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me where you think I got it wrong. And let's let's explore that. All right? Um, again, these conversation points 
uh, are designed, at least from my standpoint, is to get you ladies the best outcome that you say you want. And as a result of you getting the outcomes you say you want, guess what? We get the outcomes we say we want, right? So I want you to think and I want you to also listen more importantly with a critical ear that you hear what I'm saying, think and listen without emotion. Think without emotion. I know that's pretty difficult at times, but think without emotion. And with that being said, Let's get into it. Let's get into it. All right. Just give you a second to get your pads and your pens and all that kind of stuff. Right into it. All right, here we go. You see the title, ladies and gentlemen. You see the title. Who's stroking your anger against black men? Who's stroking your anger? See, one thing I've learned uh, when I was coming up, and I'm pretty sure many of you have heard the same thing. Um, nobody can offend you unless you what? Take offense. To take indicates an action word. It indicates something that's required of you. If someone says anything to us, and no matter who says it, we don't really get offended until we take action to become offended by what was said, right? That's why you heard the other slogan, let stuff roll off your shoulders, right? That means you don't take offense. So I use that as an example when I use the subject title tonight, who's stroking? Stroking also indicates an action. Who's stroking your, your ladies? Who's stroking your anger? against black men who represent a direct reflection of yourself who's stroking your anger against black men i'm glad you asked because i'm excited to get into it tonight we're going to explore some different areas some different avenues some different caveats that lead up to that emotional instability that we find all too often in the black community especially among our women, you, ladies, the ones we desire, but we have a really hard time coming together with. So I want you to walk with me tonight and uh, with an open mind and with a critical ear. I want you to listen actively, not simply listen to respond, but listen actively so that you'll see exactly where the conversation is intended to go in its context and how it represents you and the outcomes you say you want. And perhaps, perhaps at the end, we can come to some conclusion. You can come to a point where you can get closure about what steps to take next as it relates to these talking points. Again, the talking point tonight is who's stroking your anger against black men let's first start talk let's first start tearing apart and stripping it bare the terms the words that are used in the subject title who's stroking your anger against black men let's, let's start with the word stroking uh, stroking simply means to pay attention to uh, to pay attention to something in a manner designed to reassure or persuade. Listen to that. That's what stroking is. Stroking, right, is to pay attention to in a manner 
designed to assure or persuade. Okay, now let's look at let's look at our uh, anger. Let's look at anger. What is anger? Anger is a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. Right? A strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. Now let's bring stroking and anger together because that's part of the subject title tonight, right? Who's stroking your anger against black men? So let's bring those two definitions together and watch how they sound. Watch how they sound. To pay attention to in a manner designed to assure or persuade a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. Wow. That makes it sound totally different, doesn't it? Who's stroking your anger against black men? I'm glad you asked. Let's get into it. You have two uh, two fields of thought. Well, I should really say three fields of thought in today's modern society. You have what's called a subjective truth. And then you have what's called an objective truth. And then you have this silly, silly thing. And I, I do mean silly thing. Supported by nothing. And it's called my truth. All too often, far too often in fact, ladies love to use this my truth uh, phrase. To describe things that they either believe in, that they're convinced about, or that they're stuck in the idea of a particular thing, immovable to any other outside persuasion. They'll say, this is my truth. Well, let's get into that. I want to break it down and I want to strip it bare. I want to strip it bare. I want you to listen to me tonight because we're going to open this subject up tonight because this is affecting our whole entire community and ladies more importantly it's affecting you you are not getting the outcomes that you say you want and you're getting older and older and older still unfulfilled with the outcomes that you say you want and you've been wanting these outcomes for years you can't just seem to get it. You fall short or shy of getting the outcomes you want. Year after year, month after month, week after week, relationship, or should I say, situationship after situationship. And some of you get to the point, situationships don't even make any sense, so you just simply say, <laughs> it's complicated, <laughs> right? I want you to walk with me tonight. Again, we're talking about three uh, platforms of thought subjective truth, objective truth, and my truth. All right? What is subjective truth? Let's start there first. Subjective truth. This is a truth that's based off of a person's perspective, feelings, or opinions. Objective truth. This is subjective truth. A truth based off of a person's perspective. Listen to the difference. Subjective truth is based off of a person's perspective, feelings, or opinions. And we've always heard what opinions are, right? We've heard that everyone has one. It's like an asshole. Everybody has an opinion. So we can see how unstable and unsustainable subjective truth is. Let's go into the next uh, platform of truth. We have a thing called objective truth. What is objective truth? Objective truth in philosophy. Objectivity is the concept of truth. Independent from individual subjectivity, meaning your biases caused by one's perception, emotions, or imagination. Let me say that again. I'm going to read subjective truth again. And then I want to read objective truth because I want you to get this in your head as we go forward into the message tonight. 
subjective truth. This is a truth based off of a person's perspective, feelings, or opinions, which are unstable. You know that. People change opinions from day to day depending on how they feel or what they benefit from, from one day to the next, one event to the next, right? Opinions change all the time. So we know subjective points are really not that stable, all right? Now let's go into objective truth. Objective truth. In philosophy, objectivity is the concept of truth independent from an individual's subjectivity, meaning your biases caused by your perspective, emotions, or imaginations. So you see the difference between the two. One leans more to the facts, data, and statistics, and the other leans more to what? Your feelings. You know, it's like that song, feelings, nothing more than feelings, right? <laughs> feelings are like a roller coaster. They go up and down, up and down, up and down, depending on how you feel that day. Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. Emotions are not something you can put your confidence in. But see, subjective truth puts people in that place where they can move from one, uh, one wind to the next. Subjective truth is like a, a dead leaf blowing in the wind. You don't know what direction the wind is gonna change. It can go east, it can go west, north. It can change at any given moment without, without reason. Okay, so now we know the difference between subjective truth and objective truth. Now let's go into the most ridiculous truth that there is. It's a cousin, it's a relative to the first one, subjective truth. What is my truth? That means, that lends to say that you and I both have a truth that will supersede any other truth even if it's based in facts. I'm talking about, <laughs> when I say facts, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about verifiable truth, ver verifiable data. My truth tends to circumvent verifiable data. So here's what my truth is. My truth, it's pretentious at best. It's a substitute for non-negotiable, <laughs> non-negotiable, personal opinion. Listen at that. My truth is pretentious at best. There's no foundation that my truth stands on except your and my opinion. And once we get solid in our truth, regardless of facts, regardless of data, Regardless of statistics, they become obsolete when it becomes our truth. So what is my truth is pretentious at best. It's a substitute. You know when you had a substitute teacher in school, right? She stood in for who? The real teacher. Okay. So my truth is pretentious at best. It's a substitute for non-negotiable personal opinion. The my truth phrase is a convenient phrase for avoiding arguments because people can contradict your opinion but not your truth. The phrase is also, also often used uh, when seeking to justify a controversial personal stance or action because people are not allowed to argue with your truth. Let's keep going. My truth in and of itself is bullshit. It's a lie. Often associated with people who are not telling the truth when they have no defense to back themselves up. Often the choice of words when a horrible liar is confronted with their own stupidity. Let's keep going. Uh, not the truth something someone tries desperately to convince themselves in order to justify their activities and opinions. With that being said, let's explore the notion that there are no good men out there, which many of you ladies like to say. I'm gonna show you, I'm, I'm gonna debunk for you in just a few seconds how that's untrue. Now I want you to walk with me because it's all gonna lead right into the subject title we have tonight. 
who's stroking your anger against black men? Just keep walking with me. Now, with that being said, explore the notion that there are no good men out there. 51% of black men are single and childless. 64% of black men are in the middle class. All right? Black men in the United States are 2 million less than black women. And yet, black men are 847,000 more times likely to marry than black women. 80% of all marriages are dissolved with divorce by black women. Listen to me, listen to me. 80% of all engagements, meaning the prospect of being married, meaning he dropped down on one knee and he proposed to you in public and gave you a ring. 80% of you ladies are dissolving and ending the engagement, 80%. And here's the really sad thing I'm gonna say, and I take no pleasure in saying it, but I want you to listen, ladies. If you're serious about relationship, and if you're serious about getting to the end of life, if you can close your, uh, your ears to the noise of all of those in this country and all of those in social media and all of those on television and all of those in television series, if you can put your ears, your fingers in your ears and block the noise of those who think they are winning you can change what I'm about to say next. One in four of you, black women, will marry in a lifetime, which means three of you will die alone, unmarried. I'm gonna let that sink in just a second. If that's true, and it is, and it is, this is not based on subjective truth. No, not at all. This is not based on my truth. <laughs> no, not at all. But this is absolutely based on the truth. Facts, data, and statistics. Facts, data, and statistics says that every black woman in this country, one in four, will marry in a lifetime, which means three of you will die by yourself. Let's continue, let's continue. Uh, if every black woman in this country were married by a black man in this country, I want you to, I want to, I want to give you a visual in your mind about how serious this is. If every black man married every black woman in this country, there would still be two million black women left unmarried. So what is that saying? That's saying that no matter what we do, no matter how much effort we put forth to change the, the, the trajectory of where these stats, data, and statistics are saying about our community, meaning that one in four will uh, marry in a lifetime, which means three will die alone. If we continue the way we are right now and how we are viewing relationships and or marriage, I'm not talking about hookups. Ladies, I'm not talking about hookups. No, I'm not talking about late night dinners. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about real purposeful dating because outside of a date being done on purpose, meaning you know exactly what you want from the date, he knows what he wants from the date and, for the, and, and furthermore, ladies, don't date unless you are marriage minded. Stop dating men that are not marriage minded. What are you doing? Because you want a dinner? because you want to go to the mall, because you wanted to take your shopping. Life is about two things. It's about choices and trade-offs. What have you, what are you, and what have you traded off for every date that you've taken? Have you ever gone to the date intentionally 
on purpose looking for someone who was marriage minded, someone who was willing to stay with you to the end of life. Have you? Or has it always been a date that you could benefit from in some way, whether it was a fine meal at an expensive or an exclusive restaurant, if he took you to that, or a pair of shoes, or a pocketbook, or getting your hair done, or your nails done, or you were behind in your car note, or you, your rent was behind, or your mortgage was behind. What exactly did you go on the date for? And what were you willing to trade off to get the things I just mentioned? Was it your body? Was it sex? What did you trade off? Life is about choices and trade-offs. What did you trade off that caused you today after multiple, multiple, multiple situationships like that to cause you to be so angry at black men? Who's stroking your anger towards black men? Let's continue. Are you dating with purpose? Are you dating with purpose? Or are you listening to your girl, your angry girlfriends? Are you listening to your angry aunt? Are you listening to your angry mother? Are you listening to your angry cousin? Are you listening to your angry co-workers? Who are you listening to that's going to secure you the outcomes that you say you want? I've often said in many streams, ladies, for those of you that are in your 20s and you're between your mid-20s to late 20s, the ages between 27 and 35 is what's considered the danger zone. Shout out to Kevin Samuels. The ages between 27 to 35. These ages are considered the danger zone. Why are they called the danger zone? I need you to listen. Because many of you that end up hearing this stream, whether you're hearing it right now in real time, or whether you're listening to it in a replay, many of you are between those ages between 27 and 35. Why is it called the danger zone? Because those are the years that you ladies need to be laser focused on getting the outcomes that you say you want. What's called no man's land? Well, it means exactly what it said. No man land. And that's between the ages of 36 and 60. Why is that called no man's land? That's called no man's land because those are the years, especially at 35, every, every gynecologist in the world will tell you that at 35, you reach what's called geriatric pregnancy. I know you're saying, Charles, why every stream you keep highlighting those two areas of life? Why? Because those are the two areas of life that most of you ladies waste. You waste those years only to find yourself in old age, angry, bitter, and unable to be dealt with in a real relationship. You lose your ability to parabond. You lose your ability to pair bond. You've lost your ability to even communicate effectively in a relationship. You've become relationship atrophy, emotionally disconnected, totally bitter on the inside, stuck in your own ways after 35, to the point that when you finally get into a relationship, because here's the thing, Biologically, your body is going to have needs, yes. And you're going to want the close companionship of a man, yes. But you won't have the necessary tools on the inside, emotionally or mentally, to sustain the relationship. So what happens? You end up having a whole lot of sex, which what does to you makes you more and more and more angry and more and more and more disgruntled and more and more hopeless 
as it relates to getting any meaningful relationship to finally you just simply give up some of you at that point choose to go into what I like to, I call compound living where you live together with other ladies you share the responsibilities of the apartment or the home and you kind of sit on the couch and eat popcorn on the days off and uh, watch Netflix but that's not what you want that's what you end up that's the deal you end up agreeing with because you feel hopeless about the whole prospect of a meaningful relationship between yourself and a man and then some of you have gotten so bitter and so angry that you don't even believe you need a man society has made you believe that all you need is hot girl summer some of you have watched Megan Thee Stallion, some of you have watched Cardi B, some of you have watched uh, Beyonce, some of you have watched so many of these celebrities, so many of these series on BET and Stars and Power and all these different uh, programs on television that do not promote meaningful relationships but instead show dysfunction within a family which is black. But it doesn't show functionality, healthy functionality, healthy, meaningful relationship. No, it does not show that. It shows you money in large numbers and the things that money can buy, but what it doesn't show you is the tangibles that's necessary, the intangibles that's necessary in every relationship if it's, if it's, if it's to be defined as meaningful. You don't find those elements, you don't find those components in nothing that you watch. And you know I'm right. You know I'm right. You don't find it in nothing that you watch. Let me tell you something, uh, ladies. Propaganda is designed in two ways. It's designed to tell part of the truth and then take that same truth out of context. That's one aspect of propaganda. The other, pro the other aspect of propaganda is to create a thought process, a belief system that then determines an activity. That's what propaganda does. That's what propaganda is. And if you pay attention in our community, you can see the effects of successful propaganda. Okay, successful propaganda. And uh, here's the other problem. Here's the other problem. You get into a relationship. You never ask yourself, what does the man want that I desire? And I understand because society didn't tell you that was important. It didn't tell you that was important. Because the society doesn't promote the characteristics of what's defined as a wife. And those are the characteristics of a wife who finds it important to know and want to know what her man wants. Not what she wants. What her man wants. Because again, at the end of the day, what is the man that you say you want responsibility where you're concerned? His responsibility is to kill the wolf, tackle the bear, and then bring the meat home to you, right? His job in the middle of the night, if you hear a loud noise downstairs, is to go downstairs, address that noise, while keeping you protected upstairs in the upstairs bedroom or in the back bedroom, ordering you not to come out. Why? Because he don't. He's want. He wants to preserve you and your safety in the event that he's overcome by whatever that noise is that you heard. So in essence, he's willing to put his life on the line for you. He, in essence, is willing to die for you. That's his job. That's his job. And he does that by instinct. 
You don't have to tell him to do that. He does that by instinct. He will respond in a way to protect you even if it costs his life. So he'll tell you what? He'll say, baby, lock the bedroom door as he goes out. Locking himself out of being protected to whatever element, whatever situation or circumstances that he'll end up facing downstairs where you and him heard that noise. But he wanted to make sure you were protected behind that door. I'm, ladies, who's stroking the anger with you against the very reflection of yourself? Who's stroking that anger with the very reflection of yourself? Who's doing that? Who's doing that? And who told you that you had time if you don't get busy now and take it very serious, the whole concept of relationship, committed relationship and or marriage, who told you you had time? I just told you what the danger zone was. And I also just told you what no man's land was. Many of you, you have relatives right now who've already arrived successfully in no man's land. They're there, and they've been there for a while, and they're by themselves, and you know it. Now, there are some of you that may say, you know what, Charles, I'm happy being alone by myself. Okay. You won't get no argument from me, but I will say this. Uh, I'll give you an example of where you need to second think that idea because see many of you have never ever put paper to pen and uh, to the extent that you could actually get accurate numbers of what that looks like going into old age which we all must do <laughs> myself included we all must get there that's uh that's guaranteed that's guaranteed. We, we don't have to get there alone if we know the reality of what that means. What does that mean? Say you're 25 years old, and this is for you young ladies. Say you're 25 years old, and let's just say hypothetically you make about $50,000 a year, which is not the average. I'm gonna tell you what the average income, medium income, for a black woman in this country in just a second. And I'm also gonna tell you what the medium income for a black man in this country in just a second. But I'm gonna use a hypothetical example right now just to give you an idea of how you need to take seriously what it looks like when you reach the age of 55. What does that look like for you? I'm not talking about you being young in your 30s now thinking you got time when you really don't. Thinking you're in your late 20s and thinking you got time and you know, you look in the mirror and you think you're cute, but you really don't have time. I wanna just, I wanna let you see what pen to paper looks like. What does your life look like at 55? What does your life look like at 65? Let's talk about it. If you're 25 and say you saved, hypothetically, it's a hypothetical example, say you saved $200 a month, right? Say you saved $200 a month, let's say 40 years, just to throw a number on there, right? Say you got a cost of living raise every year at 3%. Now, you know, you know the example I'm using is <laughs> very ideal because most of you know that you don't get a 3% raise every year. You have to beg for the one 1% raise that you're asking for right now and and they're arguing with you about that So but I'm using a hypothetical example Under the most ideal situation Say you make fifty thousand dollars a year And you save two hundred dollars a month For say 40 years At three percent annual raise cost of living raise 
and let's just say that by the time you hit 65, you have $300,000 in your bank account. This is taking into consideration that you are a single woman by yourself with no man. I want you to follow me. Say you got $300,000 in the bank. For most, they would say, I'm good. I should be okay, right? Okay, let's find out if you're really okay as a single woman by yourself. $300,000. With the inflation rate rising as it has, and right now it's at the highest it's been since November of 1980 when it was at 8.6. Now it's at 9.1 as we speak. It's, it's raised, it hasn't raised that high since November of 1980, 81. You got $300,000 in the bank. You need to survive for the next 20 years with the average life expectancy at 85 years of age. You're 65, from 65 to 85, that's 20 years. You need at least 2.5 to 2.9 million dollars in disposable income. I'm talking about income that takes care of health, that takes care of your food expenses, that takes care of your living expenses, that take care of food or clothing, that takes care of any miscellaneous issues that may arise as they always do. That's taken care of while you're still able to drive, the expenses necessary to maintain the vehicle that you have until you can no longer maintain it. Um, that's to maintain just living a normal life. And I'm not talking about anything extravagant. I'm talking about just a normal life between 65 and 85. You need about 1.9 to $2 million of disposable income. If you have 300,000, you will have a $750,000 approximate shortfall between 65 and 85, which means you will not be able to sustain yourself as a single woman alone, unmarried, and not in any relationship, not only supported financially, but protected by the same reflection of yourself i.e. a black man who's stroking your anger against the black men that you say you want but yet find yourself in so much contempt for that same man that you say you want I'll tell you um, I will say this to you ladies your anger your lack of ability to get along with is not does not come without merit I understand I understand there is nothing acceptable about infidelity there is nothing acceptable about physical abuse there is nothing acceptable in any relationship about sexual abuse but I will tell you this we get who we are not what we want we get who we are and life owes myself or you no understanding. So if that's true, and it is, life does not owe us any understanding based on the bad choices that we make. We have to deal with the consequences of the choices that we make. Life is about, again, choices and trade-offs. It is. Then you have to ask yourself a question. What have I traded off? And more importantly, how many years have I traded off? And am I willing to listen to anyone that can change the direction of, of the train that I'm on to get me on a different track, going in a different direction, that I might get the outcomes that I say I want with the little bit of time or time that I have left? One thing I found with my stream. And one thing I've found with these talking points since I've been doing them, 
is that black women have this this low level of disrespect when it comes to taking any kind of advice from black men. It's almost like, I wish I would take some advice from a black man of who he think he is or what gives him the right or what does he know? Well, I'm glad you asked. I know more than you. The next question is, it's not about me. It's really about you. The stats, the data, and the statistics will not change. It won't change whether you refuse to hear it from me or you refuse to hear it from someone else. The stats and the data will not change. Those numbers will, will either increase, meaning that one in four will marry in a lifetime, meaning three of you will die alone, or they will decrease. That's the only two alternatives. They'll either increase or they will decrease. But the choice is up to you. I'm a strong proponent of therapy. So many of us have ran from the whole idea that we need therapy. There's so much mental illness in the black community. So much mental illness. How can you give to any man what you don't have? And how can he give to you what he does not have? How can he? That's like me trying to drink out of a pitcher of water and there's no water inside. Still wondering why my thirst is not quenched. How can it be quenched if there's nothing in there for me to drink? So we have reason to be dysfunctional, no doubt. But again, like I said, the world owes neither myself or you understanding. We need to figure out what we need to do to change the trajectory or the direction that our community is going in as it relates to relationships and or committed relationships and or marriage. We have to do that. Or we are saying that we don't care. And we are also saying that we don't care what the future looks like as it relates to our community. Many of you have daughters. Their future is doomed if we don't change the direction. First by changing ourselves. Many of you have sons. Their future is doomed if we don't change the direction by changing ourselves. Again, we don't get, we only get what we are. No matter how it is, how much it is that we want something different. You only can get what you are. And many of us, and ladies, you, have been looking into a mirror for years and years of your life. So many years have gotten wasted. So many relationships have dissolved. So much pain has been a result of relationships that have dissolved. And children have come into existence as a result of those bad decisions. And now, today, you look into a mirror, at a mirror that looks like it's a regular, ordinary mirror, only to find out that it's broken pieces, a reflection of your broken self. We gotta find a way to take those broken pieces and put them back together so that we can bring our community back together if we're serious about getting to the end of life. You know, society, has done a disservice to you ladies. How have they done you a disservice? They have lied to you. Lied to you. Lied to you. Many of you that have gone to school, you've been told to go to school, get an education, be strong, independent, so you don't need no man. Well, I'm gonna tell you something, ladies, that you probably didn't know. Money is involved in keeping us apart. Money, and I mean, when I tell you money, I mean billions of dollars, is involved in keeping the black family apart, in keeping men, black men, 
from black women and keeping our community fragmented. Where we have an 80%, 80 percent uh out of wedlock birth rate in our community, of which only 20% of the population of black men father those children. That's dysfunction. That is dysfunction. We're the lowest married and one of the highest divorced. Black women are walking away from their relationships. It's not black men that are walking away from their relationships. The stats, data, and statistics contradict that. Stop listening to social media. Stop listening to series on television. Stop listening to all of that. Find out how to take back your superpower, which is your femininity, because men only want a few things. Men want fit, men, men want friendly, Men want cooperative. Men want a woman who's easy to get along with. A woman who's non-combative. A woman who's a good experience. That's all a man wants. If I had to sum it up into one word, a man just simply wants cooperation. That's it. And he will give you the world just for cooperation. But, but like I mentioned, with all of that, the dynamics that our community has experienced by bad decisions, ladies, it's made you unable to be cooperative because you're always on guard. You've built up a wall so high to protect yourself from being hurt that now no one can get in and you can't get out. Therapy is so important, so important, if we intend to save our community. And getting a clear mind, clear vision about who, not only who but what, is stroking your anger. where black men are concerned, the reflection of yourself. There are a lot of good black men out there, and I'm gonna tell you something, ladies, against popular opinion or against propaganda, many black men want to be with you. Oh yeah, they do. Don't listen to the bull crap. A lot of black men want to be with you. But the way you've allowed yourselves to be so programmed by social media and by modern mentality, ideas, and feminism, and all these other toxic thought processes that, that have injected itself into the whole traditional sense of family and married life, black men are scared to death to talk to you. I'm not talking about pookie, and I'm not talking about nug nug. And I'm not talking about Tim Tim, because those are the ones you made your bad decisions about. I'm talking about real good men that are out there, and they want you. They want you. But they're scared to death, because they don't know what they're going to get. They really don't know what they're going to get. They don't know if they're going to get this toxic, loud, opinionated, over-talking, you know, combative, confrontational, loud. They don't know what they're gonna get. Yeah, to the eye, many of you are very attractive. Oh yeah, many of you are extremely attractive to the eye until you open your mouth. Right away, the door closes. And then men decide that the only thing they're gonna deal with you on and only the only level they're gonna deal with you on is sex. And that's the root of your anger. Because many of you know you're attractive. And you're wondering, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? I'm attractive, I dress nice, 
I have a decent job. I got money I'm saving. And every time I go to try to talk to a guy, I seem to attract the worst guy available. All he wants to do was put me on my back and have sex. He's doing more for you if you slow down. He's doing more for you by giving you the necessary information you need to identify yourself if you, if you slow down. We only attract who we are, not what we want. Who are you and who's stroking your anger against black men? I'm gonna open up the uh, comment box and I want you ladies to put your question in as a disclaimer. Be respectful. Be respectful of each other. Um, obviously don't res disrespect the host. <laughs> um, I want some adult questions. And what I want to do is answer, do my best to answer those questions for you in real time right now. So what I'm going to do right now is right in the box, put in your questions right now. Let's go. If you have a question, put your questions in there. Let me see who I see right now. If you have a question already in there. Uh, let's see. Okay, just put your put your questions in. Don't be shy about your questions. Ask, ask me the question that you really want to ask, or ask the question that you di uh, say what you disagree with. If I got it wrong, I want to hear your response. That's a very good statement. Uh, I'm going to respond to uh, one of the members, Althea Marshall. She, I see, I see a statement she put here. Um, in housing, they want no man living with the woman. Sad, divided family. You know what? That's important. That's 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 uh, that's good because uh, you got to look at that. Why would they provide housing for you and say that they're helping you as a family? But yet, the only requirement is that you remove the man from the house. Ain't that something? I'm going to show you how biased and how important that statement is that Althea made. Because um, in the South, they have the same kind of situation. I know many of you probably didn't even know that. They have, this, they have a subsidized situation on farms in the South. And, whenever, and with these subsidized programs that are on farms in the South, when the family become, gets to a place where they can no longer finance the farm, the government steps in to help subsidize them so that they can keep the farm, but they never require the husband to have to leave. Why does that become the requirement in the black community? That's a great question. Very good, uh, very good comment, Althea. That's something that's food for thought to think on. Put your questions in. I just wanted to touch on that. <laughs> Congratulations, Althea, on your uh, wedding. Uh, I will tell you. Remember I just said in my stream, one in four will marry. So congratulations. You won. Stay married. Stay married, no matter what. Congratulations. All right, let's see. Margaret, 
how do we start getting things back to where we should be? That's a good question. I think the first, I think the first thing we should do is, uh, I believe, one word that's been, that's been like acid reflux, that's been like toxic. I mean, it's it's, it's almost been like a, a deal breaker in the black community, and that's accountability. Accountability is so avoided in our community, especially among our women and our men. We both have a responsibility to accountability. Taking accountability simply says, you know what? I made some mistakes. Accountability says, you know what? I was wrong. Accountability says I was foolish. I was stupid. And this is why I have the outcomes that I have. And now that I recognize where the parts that I played. I mean, a movie doesn't work well unless you have actors that know their role. They have to take responsibility for the parts that they play. This is the thing that's missing in the black community. We tend to take the issues that we have in our community, in our relationships, and when we get bad outcomes, the easy route is to say it was her fault or it was his fault. And more often than not, black men become the cushion for every bad outcome. So how does that change? That changes only if we decide to take accountability. But account of, taking accountability is a mature activity. That's a mature activity. That's what an adult does. And many of us are suffering from mental illness, emotional disconnect, because of so many bad outcomes we're way beyond just simply taking accountability. We need professional help. We need to sit on somebody's couch and get a and get treated and diagnosed uh, from a, from an objective standpoint. From an objective standpoint, you know. Um, outside of that, then we come up with our own devices about how to solve a thing, and we just mess things up. So that's what I believe. That's a great question. Um, that's what I believe is the issue there. But that's a very, very, very good question. I don't think we can do it on our own. We didn't get in the situation we're in on, on our own. So there's no way we're going to get out of it on our own. But that's a, that's a great question. That's a fantastic question. Awesome. Awesome, Althea. That's right. That's right. You and your husband decided that divorce is not an option. That's right. That's right. That's right. I did a stream where I was talking about that. When uh, when you take your oaths and they say to, uh, for better or for worse, the death do you part. Most of us only are really in agreement on the, the better part. <laughs> you know, uh, the worst part, we don't want, we don't, we don't want no parts of that, you know. As soon as, it, as soon as it gets worse, we're like, I'm out of here. So that's awesome. Stick to it. And get all your single friends out of the way. All your single friends. If you have single friends, disconnect them. I ain't say hate them, but disconnect them. Lose their phone number. And make sure he does the same thing. And if you don't have any children, just go and relax and love your, love your husband and serve your husband. And y'all serve each other. And, uh, and make some babies if you can. Congratulations. Awesome. All right, let's see what we got. Okay. <laughs> I, I see that. Uh, I see, I mean, uh, I see that out there, um, looking at that response, um, let me see, you said, uh, you came out of a bad relationship, uh, Charles Brookings, wow, I wish you didn't have my name, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> before that, you said you took, uh, you took a year and a half uh, to yourself. 
with no connection relationship wise at all and you fixed you let me ask you a question during that time during that time did you did you seek professional therapy put that in a chat box if you did and if so how long and are you still in therapy right now I do. <laughs> I do. I do know who you're talking about. Uh, okay. If if this is not too personal, you you said you have six children out there, or the six children? Is it by the amazing man that you're about to marry? If that's too personal, you don't have to answer. That's too personal. You don't have to answer. Okay. All right. Okay. How long? How long have you been in therapy? Has it been more than uh, more than a year? More than two years? I will tell you this out there, and, and, and I mean this really from the bottom of my heart. Um, if you're about to be married, I would suggest, I don't know that you've done it already, but I would suggest that you go to premarital counseling. And if you have not already done that, where they separate you and him before you get married. Um, you may find some things that you need to know that you don't know yet. Uh, just in just in going to premarital counseling. I think it's very important to do that. I think most black people don't do that before they get married. Um, a lot of times we feel, like I said, with any kind of therapeutic treatment, we believe there's something taboo or weird about doing that. So we tend to think we can do it on our own. But if you're about to get married and you already have six children that God blessed you with, I would suggest that perhaps consider premarital counseling you and him together talk it over with him and see if he's in agreement with that if you have not already done that or if you're not already involved in premarital counseling right now um I, I, that's i think that's a very good idea awesome I see you wrote, uh, Afia, I see you wrote, I'm in it. Is, uh, does that indicate that you're in premarital counseling right now? Is that what that means? Uh, hmm. um, you know what? I, I'm, um, 
hear, hear me out on what I'm going to say next. I see what you're doing. If you're in church, I'm assuming that both of you guys are in church. That's extremely important. Um, I wouldn't say don't do the premarital counseling where the church is concerned. I would, I, in fact, I would encourage you, encourage that you do that. But I would even more encourage um, that you get premarital counseling from an objective standpoint, meaning outside of your faith-based uh, religion. The reason why? Because you're going to get it from a whole entirely different, purely disconnected perspective. See, um, I encourage church counseling. Absolutely, whatever your faith is, I encourage that. But I think I think you get real counseling a lot of times when it comes outside of your comfort zone, if you understand what I mean. Um, church counseling puts you, keeps you inside of your comfort zone. Getting outside of your comfort zone and getting counseling from an objective standpoint, someone that doesn't know you, they're not familiar with you and they're not familiar with him. That kind of counseling, a lot of times will tell you truths that perhaps in your faith-based counseling, you may not get. Because one thing about familiarity, for, for example, like if I know you and you know me, you may, you may fall back on telling me certain aspects of what I need to hear because you're in fear of hurting my feelings. That could happen. I'm just saying that can happen. And, but from an objective standpoint, outside of your faith base, there's no dog in the fight. If you understand what I mean, if that makes sense. There's no dog in that fight. You're talking about a person who doesn't know you, they don't know him. They're going to tell you the real truth of what they see. They're going to tell you the real truth of what they hear. And they're going to give you systematic approaches to each thing that they see so that you can take real steps in those areas that they see. That's just something to consider, you know? Um, that, again, that's your choice. Uh, I congratulate you on getting married, but that's just a perspective I want you, um, I'm trying to encourage you to look at, you know? But congratulations anyway. I mean, you beat the odds, I will tell you that. One in four were married, three will die by themselves. Unfortunately, that's not something I can change. Um, but you beat those odds. You beat those odds. Okay. Okay. You're counseling by yourself that isn't faith-based. What what exactly I don't understand. What is what does that mean? Is this from an out is this from an exterior source? question here's a question before before I end the stream uh, out there I'm, I'm here, here's what my concern is I'm looking at I'm looking at one particular comment that you made okay all right all right it's from an outside source so this is a professional uh, counselor am I right or am I, or am I misunderstanding that is this just a professional outside counselor
okay. All right, I see it, I see it. Okay, fantastic, that's awesome, that's great. Does your husband go to the counseling with you as well or no? Does your husband go to this uh, this counseling session that you go to uh, every time you attend, or not? Or is this something separate that you're doing outside of outside of your uh, fiance? Okay, all right. Here's uh, here's what I would suggest. Um, you think it over yourself, but this is what I would suggest. I, I don't believe that any counseling whatsoever, as it relates to an individual that's in a committed relationship, engagement, much less a marriage. I don't, I don't suggest. I don't think it's a good idea that one person goes independent of the other I, th I think it, and I mean you can think about it this way if you get married this is a person that you intend to stay with for the entire rest of your life you know you intend to die together so if that's true if that's the intent um, you have to you want to make sure that on both sides there are no areas that needs to be addressed, no dysfunctions whatsoever. If you're in therapy and he's not, it's not really a good idea. Even if he believes he doesn't need therapy, I think it's a good idea to encourage him or at least to suggest to him that he comes along to support you. Because that could lead to him getting also the therapy that he didn't even realize he needed or believed he needed. So, because at the end of the day, what we want to do in any relationship like that, we want to make sure we do everything to preserve it, to make it last, to make it survive. You got a lot of years uh, still left to survive it. And you don't know what storms are going to hit you from what direction that's going to work to destroy the relationship. So you need to know where each other is. And a lot of times, like, as I said, with therapy, you get it from an objective standpoint. It'll just give you the tools that you need to refer to in the event that storms start hitting you from different sides, you know? Because a lot of times what we go through, it's not, it doesn't reveal itself until later, you know? We think we're over things, and then we find out later on we're really not, because we don't know what that thing is that's gonna trigger us. And then it may trigger us and we may go off the rails, you know? So that's where therapy comes in at. It'll help you level set yourself and it'll also help level set him because before we come together, we were independent, right? Every relationship, we were independent. We weren't with one another. We didn't grow up together. We didn't grow up in the same house together. We were two independent human beings. So there's a lot of unresolved issues between both sides some of which you know where your husband is concerned and some of which you don't know and some issues that he knows and some issues he doesn't know so therapy helps all of those little monsters come out and all those little demons come out that could work later on down the road to destroy your whole marriage that's the that's the importance of therapy so I mean, something to think about. Um, I've always, I've never been a real subscriber of independent therapy. I don't, I don't think it's healthy. I don't think it's good. I don't think it works. You know, I don't think it works. But uh, you're on the right, you're in the right direction. You're on the right track. 
the fact that you're even getting therapy at all because I mean <laughs> black people <laughs> we, we swear we can do everything on our own so you're definitely on the right track absolutely oh we all have triggers you better believe it <laughs> we all have triggers <laughs> I got triggers too Althea <laughs> Yeah, we all got triggers. Absolutely, we all have triggers. Uh, Althea, I thank you so much for your participation in the stream tonight. You made it very exciting. I appreciate everybody's comments. I appreciate everybody's input in the stream tonight. This, this was something completely different. I've never done this in any stream where I spent an additional amount of time uh, on the stream to allow comments and me answering those questions. So I absolutely appreciate uh, all of you that have participated in the stream. Um, keep coming back, keep supporting it because at, at the end of the day, the stream is really about getting the results that and the outcomes that uh, you ladies say you want. And as a result of you getting the outcomes you want, we in turn get the outcomes we want because we are better together than we are apart. With that being said, I am your host, Charles Chambers. Good night to all, have a blessed night. And this is the end of Let's Talk About It. We are out.